Okay, Rich Folly here. We're on the set of Book View now at BookCon 2015. We're entering into our last hour of live stream coverage. It's been a fantastic two days. We're going to close out our hour with guest host David Levitham. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to have you for the full hour. Great, great to be here. Yeah, it's wonderful. David, let's start with a discussion about your new book, Hold Me Closer, The Tiny Cooper Story. All fans of Will Grace and Will Grace and know who Tiny Cooper is, but you should probably tell us who is Tiny Cooper. Um, well, in in the very first paragraph of, of Will Grace and Will Grayson, so it was one of John Green's chapters, um, we're introduced to Tiny Cooper, who is his Will Grayson's best friend and is described as being very, very, very large and very, very, very gay and is writing a musical based on his own life. and and. In Will Grayson, Will Grayson, you get to see five or six of the musical numbers from this musical, some of them written by John, some of them written by me. Um, and you, as soon as we were touring for the book, we knew, I mean, as soon as we were done writing the book, we knew Tiny Cooper had stolen the book from the Will Graysons. Um, but when we were touring for the book, the re reaction was so much love for Tiny Cooper. I was like, we have to actually write this musical. We have to sort of see more of Tiny and what his whole life was like. And John was like, that's great go for it. And so I did, and that's really what the book is. It's either a novel in musical form or a musical in novel form. We haven't quite figured out which one it is yet. Yeah, it's certainly larger than life. Tiny Cooper is an incredibly, he's, lar he's large in every way, but yes. he's larger <laughs> than life, absolutely. And he's definitely one of those characters that just you never forget. So it's fun that you decided to kind of extend this. But have you ever written musical theater before like this? I mean, this is like, a, you know, no. write a musical. No, I, I did not, and that was certainly the challenge of writing the book. Um, I've seen lots of musicals, um, I listen to a lot of music, but no, I, I had not. And, and I think it, it is the incremental effect that I think, had I not written the numbers in Will Grace and Will Grayson, I would never have thought I could have pulled this off. Um, but it was because some of the numbers were already written, and again, John had written some, I had written some, since there was sort of already a template for it, it made it much, much easier, whereas if I had just woken up one morning and said, I'm going to write a musical novel from scratch. Yeah. I think I would have been too freaked out to do it. Yeah, let's set the table a little bit. You and John Green wrote a book called Will Grace and Will Grayson, yes. where you alternate chapters and wrote it together, basically. There's two Will Graysons you each wrote uh, in the voice of one Will Grayson, John wrote in the voice of the other Will Grayson. How did you decide, first of all, let's go back to that book. How did you decide to do that and to work together and collaborate? Well, it started, I mean, I, I had written a book with Rachel Cohn, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, um, and had loved collaborating. Um, it just, it was the most fun experience still to date that I've ever had writing. Um, and so I wanted to do that more and still do that with Rachel, but also try different things with different authors. And John and I, we're friends. We had met just because I read Looking for Alaska and sent him an, e an email being like, oh, I love your book. And and he was like, oh, you're the first author to actually get in touch with me about the book. And we, we just wow, became friends. that's something because probably other authors have I now have. Yes, I think, I think many did after that. But I was lucky somebody slipped me an advanced copy uh, very, very, very early. Um, and and so I would be at my, my office job um, at Scholastic and he would be at his office job then at, at Booklist. And on Friday afternoons, we just call each other and just chat, like just talk shop or everything. And one day I was like, hey, I had this idea. Um, because I had this friend in college, or a friend shortly after college, named David Leventhal. Um, and we went to college together, but did not meet until the last week of school. And we were always mistaken for each other. And because of that, I'd always been fascinated with the idea of like having a double. Yeah. And so I was like, wouldn't it be awesome to write a double novel? Or at the time, I first proposed it with four different authors writing four different characters with the same name. And John's first reaction was, let's just do it the two of us. Um, and so I was like, all right, that, that's cool. Maybe more manageable, too. Yeah, more manageable. He, he later joked that it meant that just we'd be splitting the money in half instead of in quarters, <laughs> and that's why he said it. Who knows? Who knows how the mind of John Green works? But we really we just really dove into that and we decided that we would not, instead of talking it over and trying to plan it, we would really be spontaneous. So we basically chose the name, Will Grayson. We chose where they lived and sort of where the, their stories would meet. Mm -hmm. um, but that was it. And then we went off and he wrote his first chapter, I wrote my first chapter. And then we got together um, and read them aloud to each other and to his wife, Sarah. And that's where it all it all began. Well, how did the, who, where did the tiny character come from? Was that one or the other, or were you guys just coming up with the largest character you could think of? No, it was, it was all John. It was all in his first chapter. I mean, literally, we were there in his apartment in New York, and he started reading and was like, 
about you can pick your friends and pick your nose, you can't pick your friends' noses, and then went on to that and introduced Tiny Cooper. And sort of every part of my brain was like, oh, I like this character. Oh, I can't wait. I mean, again, our chapters weren't going to cross for another whatever half a book, right. but I was waiting. I was like, when Tiny Cooper gets into my world, I am going to use yeah. him. And sure enough, he does sort of shuttle between John's chapters and my chapters. So but, did you know at the time when you were when you sort of attached yourself to Tiny and were really liking that character that there may be more to Tiny's story that we were going to eventually find out with this book? Not really. I mean, because a lot of the times when you write book, uh, books, there are secondary characters that run off with the books. Like my first book, Boy Meets Boy, there's a character, Infinite Darlene, that like just chews up and spits out every scene she's in. She just runs away with it. But usually then that's it when the book is done. But there was something about Tiny and the reaction to Tiny that... It, it really demanded to be heard more. And I had obviously written many other coming out stories and about other gay characters, so the question was, well, how would this be different? But because I already knew Tiny so well, I knew it would be completely different, not just because it was musical form, yeah. but because he was coming at it from a very different point of view, that he was completely accepted from the beginning and knew who he was from the beginning, so it wouldn't be a traditional coming out and the agony of misery of coming out, it really would be much more lively than that. Yeah, well, it certainly is that. And we talked earlier, too, about the fact that you have a publishing job that you've not left. You're a very successful writer, but you're still going to work every day for Scholastic and serving in that function. Yesterday, you were here with another author that you delivered that was from the Scholastic side. Yeah. No, I mean, I love, I, I'm lucky because I love playing with other people's words as much as I love playing with my own. That, yeah. that there is something, I was really an editor first before I became an author, and there's something about that that I just think is really, it's, it's, the, it's part of the puzzle that you're trying to solve, that yeah. you're trying to make the book the best it can be. And so I love that part so much. I also don't think I'd do very well being a full-time writer. I think I can live in my own head for a very short period, for very short periods of time. If I had to live full-time just creating my own stories, I think that would drive me a little crazy. So when you have so many stories as an editor in your head, maybe you're working on one or two books at a time, you have your own books and you have your own stories and your own ideation going out at the same time. How do you segment and compartmentalize your, your worlds? I mean, I think it is, for me, it's a very easy calendar thing that usually during the week I work on other people's books and on weekends I work on my own. And uh -huh. sometimes it bleeds, but for the most part, I maintain that. So it would be ridiculous of me to try to edit by day and then come home at that night and try to shift into my own story. I just right. can't do it. So it's really whatever project I'm working on at that very moment really has the attention of my full sort of word-based mind mm -hmm. and then... I will switch on the weekend to my own books. So when did you do the research for the musical writing? I mean, writing writing sort of a musical, you had to go find someone who could help you, guide you through that process. Yeah, I did. I mean, it, it was very funny because, again, I've, li I've listened to musicals all my life. I, I was not an actor. Um, and amusingly, for touring this book, I'm not a good singer, so, so it's made it very hard to tour the book. But I did have a friend, Hunter Bell, who, who um, wrote this show, title of show, which I love. And so I did just a Facebook message him. It was like, hey, so I'm doing this crazy thing. Remember Will Grayson? Remember the musical number as well? I'm now doing the full musical. Could you read this? And he was very, very sweet um, and read it. Um, and I did that. We had a very funny lunch because he also happens to be one of the nicest people in the world. And that isn't always the right person to ask to read your book. So he's like, oh, it's great. I'd be like, yeah. no, but tell me what's wrong with it. He'd be like, shreds. no, it's really great. I'd be like, yeah. no, tell me, tell me. No, it's, it's great. No, I want to know what's wrong with it. It's great. Um, so it was very funny. And, but ultimately, he was like, no, genuinely, I know you will fall flat on your face if this is wrong, but I know musicals and this works as a musical. Wow, yeah. out of the gate, kind of nailed it though. Yeah, kind of, I mean, after, it was, he certainly didn't see the roughest of the dress. Um, and then there was the really embarrassing part where I read my page proofs aloud every time they come in just for one last go. So for this book, I did have to sit in my apartment alone and sing every song just to make sure that they could be sung. By yourself? Or did you have by, Oh, totally by myself. I mean, I really hope that the, the neighbors didn't hear because they would have been like, what is going on in it that? It works with Tiny to hear you sing. That I guess fun. so. I, I wish I had Tiny's yeah. lungs, but I don't. Wow. Well, I'm looking forward to spending an hour with you, David, and having some great guests coming on. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're going to be talking about, too, is the initiative here at BEA for We Need More Diverse Books. Mm -hmm. 
Do you, you know, tell us a little bit about that, and some of the people that we have are going to be talking about that as well. Matt De La Pena and Jacqueline Woodson both um, are involved in that organization too. Yeah, no, it, it is. We Need Diverse Books was something that sprung up last year um, from BookCon when the initial lineup was announced. There was just a complete lack of diversity. Um, and instead of just taking it or complaining about it, this group of authors got together and really were activists about it and said, no, this needs to be fixed. We will help you fix it. And they did. Yeah. Um, and really, from that one incident, really spawned this amazing nonprofit organization um, that is really dedicated to having as many voices in children's and teen literature as possible. And the, at this book con, it was great. We just had a panel this morning, really, to sort of celebrate everything that has been accomplished in the past year because yeah. sort of diversity has always been something that people within publishing have supported and have wanted, but it really with the attention and the media that attention that it got, it had an extra force behind it this yeah. year and a lot of change has actually happened. And it's emboldening, it's, uh, it's giving uh, authors an opening to sort of experiment and play with some ideas maybe that they really want to because there's a movement in like, yeah. let's do this. And yeah. So I think it's pushing them out too. Yeah. Well, I look forward to talking about that some more. I look forward to spending the entire hour with you. Yes. We'll be back in just a minute. We're going to have Jacqueline Woodson out here in just a few minutes, and we look forward to having you back. So stick around. We're going to run to a segment now, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Who's your favorite author? I think Joey Graceffa. And what do you about what his work do you like? Well, I think he's really funny, and you can just really relate to him. Who's your favorite author? That's a long list, and I'm not sure we want you want to go there. John Green. Yeah. What do you like about his books? Um, I really like how he can perceive uh, teenagers very accurately. Um, he, it's very believable the way he uh, creates his characters, and I like that. Here right now, Marie Lu. I'm so excited to see her. So many um, of the authors that are here, probably Rainbow Rowell. What do you like about her book? Everything. I've read all of her books, and I will read them all again. <laughs> My favorite author is Chuck Klosterman. What about his books do you like? Well, I love his nonfiction. It's so smart. It's really witty. It makes you look at the world in a different way. And I love his fiction because it's just really brilliant and shows a different side to some like really human emotions in ways that are really understated. I can't decide. <laughs> You're probably uh, Marie Lu. And who's your favorite author? Um, Joey Graceffa. Joey Graceffa. Favorite author? Mm, I was really excited for Simon & Schuster giving away the Stephen King book a couple of days beforehand because I do love Stephen King. What about Stephen King's books do you like? I just like the suspense and everything about it. Just, you can't put it down. I like fantasy mm -hmm. a lot. Why do you like fantasy? Um, I guess because it's like so different from what I experience every day. Who's one of your favorite authors? Um, I would have to say either John Green or, yeah, okay. Why do you like John Green's books? Because they, they could, you could connect to them in your own way. Like, like every story has its own meaning to every person who reads it. And what do you like about John Green's books? Um, well, they're the kind of like reality, but they're not. They're better. Well, but I like Marissa Meyer. So she said Marie Lou. I'll take Marissa Meyer. Meyer. What do you like about her book? Um, it's like a fairy, fairy tale retelling, so that's really cool. Because I love fairy tales since I was a kid, so that's a way to grow up with fairy tale. <laughs> Definitely Sarah Dessen. I've been reading her yeah, since. I was say I've been, the two of us have been reading her books since we were like 12. Yeah. <laughs> Who's your favorite author so far? Uh, book on. Um, probably Rainbow Rowell. Yeah, she's really funny. Mm -hmm. David Levithan. Yeah. What do you like about his books? Um, I like how they're about LGBTQIA people, and it's just like. There, there should be more representation in books for gay people. And who's your favorite author? Um, it's also David Levithan because um, I really like his books. Yeah. What do you like about her books? Um, I love that they have like so much action in, in them, and that they're like really engaging. And then <laughs> it's like I don't know, it just catches me. Who's your favorite author? Rochelle Mead. What do you like about her books? Um, I like how it really draws in the reader, and like I feel so attached to all the characters. Who's your favorite author? Alfie. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it they're, they're, all, they're all so amazing. Yeah. Like, I really like Grace and Alfie. Yeah. What do you like about their books? They really interact with you, and they're so sweet and nice and everything. Yeah. Okay, Rich Folly here on the set of Book View Now at BookCon 2015. BookCon's coming to a close this Sunday. It's been a wonderful two days. Hundreds of thousands of passionate readers in one place. 
makes it a lot of fun for authors to be here. David Levithan has been with us as the guest host. He's going to stick around for a while. And we have a new guest, Jacqueline Woodson. It's so nice to have you. Yeah. Jacqueline's the author of Brown Girl Dreaming, a National Book Award winner. I've been told that there's many more stickers on this book brand. now. Honor, yeah. Yes, they just keep coming. Um, and when, David, when you suggested that we bring Jacqueline on, I was thrilled because we had just spoken in Los Angeles, and I said, absolutely, let's go. Let's bring her back. If she'll have us, let's do it. So it was so cool that we have you back. Thanks, yeah. David. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I think this morning we were on a We Need Diverse Books panel and that certainly has been part of the story of this year and just wondering your impressions about sort of have there been changes this year oh man I think one of the biggest changes is the amount of energy that's mm -hmm. grown around the need for diverse books um, and just um, I feel like it's coming there, there there's an energy there are people writing there are people supporting the writing there are people looking for the writers um, there are publishers saying wait there's something wrong with this picture inside our publishing house and so yeah I'm, I'm seeing enormous changes at the last minute <laughs> and obviously it dovetailed with Brown Girl Dreaming coming out and a lot of the attention that came to it I mean yeah I mean how has it been to just have that book be sort of sort of one of the sort of tentpole books in this discussion. I mean, <laughs> certainly this is not something you could have anticipated while you were writing it. I, I swear, you know, my poor partner had to suffer through me whining about how no one was ever going to read this. Why am I writing this? And, it, you know, I'm usually working on two or three books, and it was the only thing I was working on. So I'm, like, kind of struggling around that, too. So I'm, I'm stunned. I'm, 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 like, stunned that every time it gets a, a new accolade, I'm like, whoa, well, you know, it, it's pretty surreal and unreal and exciting. You know, I think too, uh, with Brown Girl Dreaming and with some other books too, some of the authors, and I mentioned this to David in the last segment, so many of the authors we're talking to are pushing in a territory that maybe they hadn't pushed into before because I think they feel like there's like this awesome door opening right now to just try things maybe that were on the edge of their mind, maybe they hadn't decided to do or they're in other worlds. And the authors are pushing. It's not just the publishers. I think the authors are thinking about it too. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I feel like it happened in the '90s. There, the doors open, and we saw a lot of diverse books come into the world. And then the doors kind of closed again. And 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 it's true, not only diverse in the people who are writing them and what they look like, but the way they were telling stories. Right. Um, and well, I, I think they closed. I think. I don't. I don't know. I think David would better answer that question. I. I. I don't think people stopped writing. You know. I, sadly, it's a business. I don't know what the numbers were. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think we were talking about this earlier this morning. That. That. This the perception of a lot of the diverse books was. Oh, these are for libraries, or oh, these are not for the the kid or adult walking to the bookstore isn't going to be. Oh, I want this again. Yeah. And this is incorrect. But yeah. I think there was a thought that. And, and looking at the sales patterns, that, that's where a large majority of the sales were, partially, so you said, because there wasn't the energy behind it and there wasn't mm -hmm. people sort of calling people out for ignoring these books. And I think it is lately, um, especially with the rise of social media and sort of the exposure that can give, that that has really tried to, so the, the institutional literary and the commercial used to be sort of at two different yeah. poles, but I think now they're merging much, much more closely. And yeah. I think there are lots of amazing books that are being rewarded because of that. And again, not just the diverse books, I mean, but a book like Marcus Uzek's The Book Thief, which would have been totally pegged as sort of a small literary novel mm -hmm. um, 15 years ago, or even 10 years ago, but it was a phenomenon um, because even though it took so many literary risks, it still ended up being commercial. Um, and I think that's really exciting for the people yeah. within the publishing houses because we can we can point to all of these things. And if anybody says, "Oh, a poetry memoir, really?" and you can sort of point, "No, no, look at what Brown Girl Dreaming did," or just as other narrative risks, or for me, like, "Oh, a novel in musical form." I mean, like, doesn't that seem a little gay, David? I mean, like, <laughs> yes, yes, in fact, it does, and it's gonna sell. It um, is gonna sell. I mean, and that's really. I've remarkable. already bought it twice. Well, thank you. <laughs> You know, I guess that's the bone of my questions is to what degree do you think that sort of the rising tide of the YA world, which has become, I mean, the velocity of growth in this category 
is exciting on one hand, but at the other hand, it's like it's bringing so many more people into it, which is sort of opening the, like people's eyes to the variety of stuff in this. It isn't just the movie adaptations, though there's certainly a lot driving there, or just some of these major authors that are moving the category. But when those people help drive more people into it, and you're getting YouTubers now who are doing mm -hmm. just book stuff, and you're seeing the energy that comes along with an event like BookCon, it seems like that's good for everybody who's writing in this category right now. It does, and it also, what's so good is that adults are recognizing that YA isn't something that just young adults need to read, right. that right. they were that age once, and a lot of it still resonates. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole other group of people coming to the books and say, seeing um, how valid they are for their own, to their own experiences. Yeah. I, I wonder at what point does the YA tag become something that's a little outdated. I mean, there's people who, well, there's been things <coughs> written about like adults shouldn't read YA, and if you, I mean, I've re read things, you know, where there's been some essays that have made their way in the world. But I look at a book like Brown Girl Dreaming, or I've read Wonder, or David, your books, there's so much depth to the storytelling. There's heart rending stories and emotions that come to the forefront. What does YA even mean anymore to you guys? Um, well, to me, it means that um, that's what the publishers know. That's the label they know. I mean, I, I always think of the terms as, as business terms more than anything else. So, you know, I, I write novels. I write novels that are considered YA because that's the house that represents me, you know, and that's what they know how to sell it as. Yeah. But I think for the most part, so much of what we write is universal. And I'm talking about picture books, too. I'm talking about, I go to picture books when I'm struggling with writing poetry because so many of the really well-written po picture books are really poetic. Um, and, you know, I go to, I, my shelves are filled with books by, you know, my peers because they tell very <laughs> interesting and deep stories and they don't try to take any shortcuts. So, they're, so I, I think it's... Um, it's the range is so much broader now than what it was maybe even 10 years ago. And I think the mistake is thinking that YA means that it is for teenagers. I mean, mm -hmm. when really YA means that it includes teenagers. And I think that we've seen that shift happen. Um, and I think YA is both for the teenagers, but it is also a subgenre of adult now, that there are so many adults who read it but they do identify it as YA because when they get YA they know there will be a certain amount of emotional truth to it. There will be a certain kind of storytelling to it that they won't necessarily get in other subgenres of adult. And that is meaningful, I think, um, even though it does not necessarily mean what people originally thought it meant. Yeah. Why do you think um, uh, that the w authors within the YA category, and maybe this is just me looking from the outside in, you, guys, you, you could probably tell me differently, but seem to be there seems to be a more tight-knit element to it now I certainly see friendships formed in the adult uh, book world but within the YA world there seems to be such deep friendships and connections well I think one reason is um, you know I I think a lot of the people I love in the world of YA don't feel competitive right. um, we feel like there's enough pie for everyone we don't you know necessarily for the most part review each other's books I mean sometimes that you know when you look at some of the um, papers and stuff other writers are reviewing but you know teachers are reviewing librarians are reviewing book reviewers and um, people who are doing critical literary stuff are reviewing it um, but um, and I think there there is you know having been in both worlds I felt like when I was writing strictly for adults there was this kind of tension and it's, it felt like there was more of a competition there but for us we talk about our books what we're working on with each other and there's such a deep support system and we do know each other because of yeah. these conferences yeah. because we live in the same neighborhood because you know we our children have gone to school together and it is I, I, I adore the YA children's community in a way that I never felt that when I was writing for adults. I know, it does seem that way. There's a generosity to it, and it is, I mean, I would say that there's no reason to be competitive, because mm -hmm. if somebody loves Jackie's book, then they'll be inspired to read my book, mm -hmm. or vice versa, or Matt's, or Libba's, or whomever's, that, that the great thing about readers of YA is the more they read, the more they want to read more. Mm -hmm. And none of us have a backlist that could sustain them solely. You cannot just read Jackie's book yeah. or just read my books like you you want to read as widely as possible and we encourage that yeah. um, and so any book that gets a teenager or an adult reading why I'm excited about books that helps me I don't feel competitive with that at all I in fact embrace that 
Yeah. Um, and I think that we, we get that. Um, whereas, again, I, my foray into the adult world, it, it was much more competitive and who's going to whatever get which prize. And it just seemed like that they felt like it was a zero-sum game, whereas for us it's an ever-expanding game. Mm -hmm. I get the sense, too. You know, it feels like sort of uh, you're in the university, you know, system or something as a, as a professor and, you know, you're competing against, you know, yours to get tenure and things. Whereas with, we had guest hosts all week on this live stream and authors sitting with authors, always picking them and the, you know, connections, and the, you know, the, the kinetic energy between them has been part of the fun of this event for me. I mean, it's really great to see. Yeah, and, and I think, and... We're, if I may say so, a little old school um, compared to, I mean, the others. I mean, I'm always struck. I am not a social media person, but I think so many of the friendships are forged and solidified over social media. And I'm always amazed that I will be at events with authors who are talking up a storm to each other. And I'm like, oh, they've known each other for years. That's great. And then, then they'll turn to me and say, this is the first time we've ever met in person. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. It, but it does enable place. us to find each other and talk to each other in the same exact way that our readers are finding each other and befriending each other and supporting each other, which right. is just sort of magical in my mind. Right, well that's certainly what's made the um, energy of this event so wonderful. Yeah. And Jacqueline, it's been great to have oh. you again. Thanks, it's Really Rich. awesome to have you here. David, you're sticking around All with right. me. Um, and we'll be right back. This is Jacqueline Woodson, Brown Girl Dreaming. David Levitan's with me for a little bit longer. We're at BookCon 2015 and we're heading into the home stretch. Thanks for watching. About five years ago, uh, my daughter was teaching school, her first year of teaching school. She was teaching a bunch of fifth graders, and she was uh, really emphasizing reading, as you might guess, because, you know, we read a lot. And she asked me, she said, Dad, could you write suspense for kids? And she said, I can't find any. Did you ever thought of it before? Never, never. And she said, the kids can read, there's a lot of fantasy, there's a lot of historical fiction, there's a lot of stuff. I can't find any real good suspense for kids. And that's how it got started. I thought, well, I, maybe, I don't know, let me see. And so this character slowly developed a 13-year-old kid who's both, he's the only child, uh, both parents are lawyers, and he thinks he's a lawyer. Yeah, I'm a huge Encyclopedia Brown kid growing yeah, up, yeah, right? I mean, you know, you got, you got Theodore Boone, I'm ready to jump on. Yeah, he, I mean, he's, he's very bright. Uh, he's also a kid who gets in a lot of trouble. Uh, loves to give legal advice to his friends, uh, some of which is not always accurate, but, you know, that's, that's Theo's world. Yeah. And also, when I was a 13-year-old kid, uh, it was, a, it was a good, one of those good years for me. You know, I was in the eighth grade. I was active. I played sports. I had a great teacher, homeroom teacher. I had good buddies. Just one of those magical years, you know, before you go off to the ninth grade in high right. school. And I was very active in scouting. We were in the woods all the time, canoeing and camping and a lot of adventures, you know. And so Theo will always be 13. I can't see Theo growing up. I hope yeah, I don't want him to grow up. No. I mean, you know, from what I've read, and I've only read The Fugitive, the new one, it's, uh, I want him that age. Yeah. He's a great kid. I, I have some my, that age myself right now. It is a magical time. It's yeah. before they're in that high school scene with all the pressures that come along with that. And they're really inquisitive and fun. And they're reading, you know, still. So I hope that they continue to read with Theodore Boone. Uh, I hope so, too. And, and Theo, one, one thing I try to do with Theo is teach kids about the law. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of law, uh, especially the courtroom stuff in Theo. And slowly, maybe kids will learn something. So that's, yeah. that's one goal. All right, welcome back. We're at BookCon 2015. I'm Rich Folly. We have another half an hour to go before the end of our live stream. And this is Book View Now. David Levithan kindly came to join us as guest host this hour. Wrap it all up, yes. <laughs> Wrap it up, to bring us home. But before that, we have the fabulous Luba Bray with us on the couch. Come on. Hi, Rich. Very nice. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. You are the author of Lair of Dreams. Look at the cover. This, this is beautiful. Ooh. Beautiful cover. Uh, a diviner's novel, a world we got to know quite well in the diviners, the original release. Now you're coming back with book two. How exciting. <laughs> and yes, how exciting. It is exciting. I, it's exciting. It's fabulous. I lived through it. It's, yes. it's, it's done. <laughs> now you get to talk about it. Is that the fun part? Or is like, you know, do, would you is that more painful than actually doing the writing? I thought putting my hand in a in a bowl of Chex mix was actually the fun part. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like I'm I'm done. You guys take it from here. I'm mm, snacks. 
Well, we should still, well, tell us about it. Tell us now that you're out in the world and you're starting to talk about this and, uh, and it's coming out in August. It is August 25th. Yeah. August 25th? August 25th. I hardly know her. Huh. It's the day after the 24th. <laughs> no way. It's the word on the street. What's it about? Is it more Lair or August more Dreams? August 25th? It's about, oh, it's about a day after <laughs> August 24th. Fine day in the summer. Come on, come on. There's a lot of pages there. Surely, surely there's something inside <laughs> yes, of it. Yes, it, it doubles as it it doubles as an end table it's right. or an it's upper massive. body workout. It's beautiful. Oh wow, you can you can do it with marbles. Like yeah, there we go. Just like it's, in, it's it's too. Uh, Brian's, can you hold them? Oh my God, she can hold them both at once. That is That's your amazing. Weight. That's your weight oh, Brian right Selznick, you have defeated me. Oh. You have to learn how Actually, to draw. This one is a hunk and. That is beautiful book. It's beautiful. So what is your book about? Oh, what do, stop! Stop dancing around. I'm sorry. Uh, what the American is, public wants to know. It's about 691 pages currently. It's uh, it is the sequel to The Diviners. It is set in 1920s New York City, and it involves the supernatural. My my editor Alvina Ling, the amazing Alvina Ling. Always the amazing Alvina. She Ling. is. Yeah. She is great. She's just as amazing. She's just as, she as was amazing. Diviners, yeah. yeah. She's she might actually be a little more amazing <laughs> because she she, she managed to make that happen. She has amazing stripes. Yes. Um, she uh, she calls it the Great Gatsby meets Stephen King, and I I am. Grateful with to her <laughs> with flappers, X Files yeah. with flappers, yes, right. and it concerns a group of um, a large cast of characters, all of whom have some sort of supernatural ability, and there seems to be this uh, this evil that is awakening. Mm -hmm. um, and in 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 the first diviners. Um, <laughs> wow, wouldn't it be great if I were able to actually tell you about my own book? I'm I going to do this I, in I, mine. I, I think I can actually tell you more about it than you can. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump rich, in. Wow. Well, I will say that like the 1920s is so well represented in this book, though. And like I, you spent another six or seven hundred pages writing about the 1920s and the diviners. I just wanted to know if this 700 pages is as fun once you're diving into an era like that, when you're so submerged in the world and the research and the librarians that you turn to for all of your research. Was it as fun, you know, going deep into the same era? Are you looking like, can I get to the 30s by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, and I think because the 1920s is such a fascinating period, because it's, it, it, it feels like something that came out of central casting. It's a decade that feels like it came out of central casting. It is, I mean, you've got the Ziegfeld Follies, you've got Prohibition, you've got organized crime, you've got flappers, but you've also got a lot of social change. And I think that that is one of the things that really drew me to writing about this period was um, that I was kind of trying to, I, I, I kind of wanted to write about post 9-11 America and then looking at the 1920s of course I saw all of these parallels mm -hmm. um, and whenever you have a great amount of social change you get a lot of fear and so it was very interesting and at times um, you know heartbreaking to see that as I was writing on this and um, you know, and I'm writing about racism and xenophobia and and um, class struggle, and to see that yes, we are still here. Yeah, we are still. We here. haven't made the progress that we should have probably made by now. Yeah, so those are all topics that um, you know can consume you for this. It's also something that um, as you're looking at your button that you're wearing right now, we need diverse books. It's still, to your point, a topic that we're still addressing. We were, we had Jacqueline Woodson on a set earlier, and David and I were talking about how. We made some progress with that a while ago, and then it seemed to have stopped, and now we've made a lot more progress. What's your involvement with this group? Um, well, I'm basically, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm in awe of the work that We Need Diverse Books has done, and I, I think that um, just, I think the, we were talking this morning about, um, about continuing the conversation and the fact that how wonderful it was to see that, that you know, uh, I know Jackie was talk talking about uh, how social media had really kind of helped make you know this, this grassroots change, and to see that the conversation is still going and that it's strong and it's getting stronger, um, and I'm just happy to be part of the conversation. Yeah, and you see this conference, which has never existed. You know, a few years ago there wasn't a conference of readers coming together in one place. Then you know we saw Comic Con sort of explode, and Book Expo was always sort of a private event. There were some great book festivals, Miami, Los Angeles, and some great others. But this has been fun to see a con that has the word book in front of it and people actually getting super thrilled by it. I think that sort of reader world is sort of driving a lot of this too. They seem so open to all of this right now. 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you can see that there are swarms of teenagers at the Javits right. Center yeah. on a Sunday. They had to walk a long way to get here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty incredible thing. And to have, um, you know, to, to see readers coming up and also talking about how these books have, in, have affected them and about how they themselves are telling their own stories. Mm -hmm. um, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, this generation is, I, I think, pretty, pretty fascinating, pretty savvy um, and thoughtful. I mean, I think that they are, they are changing the world. Yeah, so. I see that with my own kids. My own kids seem so much more together than I was at their age. I mean, all of them are, um, smart they're they're more self they're more self-aware they're more aware of other people they seem more empathetic than i was at that time um i'm not sure what happened to my generation but this <laughs> new one seems like they're in pretty right? good shape right i was now. like checking my hair for split ends and listening to led zeppelin <laughs> yeah. i mean you know i, 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 I could not have been trusted with anything it's terrible and i think we're probably close i don't know if we're all the same age or not but i think we're probably pretty close 29 yeah, yeah. right around there <laughs> right around there David uh, qualified himself as old school before, right. so you guys have both been in publishing and books for a long time. We've been it's through the wars around. together, haven't we, darling? Oh, David. <laughs> but you've seen oh, there's Halcyon days. You both have seen it up close, though, the change. I mean, has it been yeah. something that you think has just jumped really dramatically recently, or has this been sort of a gradual shift in the way people are approaching reading? Well, I mean, I think, I think there's pre-Harry Potter and post-Harry Potter. I mean, I think... I, Harry Potter was the thing that engaged so many people so quickly and so intensely and made reading an event. Um, and I think certainly there have been important books before that, there will be important books after that. But for our times, I think a lot of the teenagers and certainly the 20-somethings that we are seeing here at BookCon, they were first energized as 9-year-olds or 10-year-olds waiting for Harry Potter 4 to come out. Yeah. And I think that 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 was a shift and obviously social media and book culture changed very rapidly at the same time and that has really altered the landscape of our lives as authors considerably that we get so much feedback um, all the time most of it positive it really it's it's really exciting I mean and I think although I want to talk about talking about sort of the younger generation made me think about sort of the conversations you you had with with Josh and his friends about feminism and YA and just sort of talking to them and I was really blown away by how clear-headed they are um, in looking at sort of the way that books are presented to them and that I know is something you've spoken about a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I ended up having a conversation uh, last year with some teens. Um, I was actually writing about gender in books uh, because there had been this sort of unfortunate trend in publishing of saying, well, that's a boy book or that's a girl book. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, they are books. Right, right. They, they do not have gender in and of themselves. But this, of course, is a marketing right. uh, thing. And to say, you know, well, this is a boy book or this is a girl book. And overwhelmingly, when we say this is a boy book, what we're saying is this is a book that is important. And when we say this is a girl book, usually what happens is that is a way of dismissing the book. and. You know, and, and to say to, to a boy, you know, oh, well, you don't have to read that if you want. It's, it's a girl book is, in effect, saying you don't have to be concerned with 51% of the population, right. which is a very bad message to send for, for boys as, and, and for girls. Um, but I ended up having this conversation with all these teens about how books were marketed to them and had books ever been marketed to them along gender lines. And they were completely aware of the way that that happened and they would talk about how oh yes if a, if a book has a blue and gray cover they're trying to market it to a boy and they could just tell from you know from a distance um, but it was also I think very eye-opening to discover that some of these teens had come to to some of the conferences and they would go up to the publishing booths and they told a story of going up these uh, these two girls had gone up and asked about a book, and it was one of those blue-gray covers, right. and the person in the booth said, you know, I don't think that you really it's want you. that book. I think that's for your friend, yeah. who was male, and, um, you know. Color cues tell the story. But it was just also the, the, the idea that publishing, it's like, no, 
your readership is already so far ahead of you right. in terms of being, you know, involved. Right. You need to get with the program. Yeah. Somebody's got to be keeping up, you know, or at least yeah. staying a step ahead of the game is ideal, but at least keeping up, at minimum, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's really challenging uh, because I think that you're, you're dealing with big business, um, and business is just trying to figure out how to make the most money sometimes. Even the best intentioned publishers are, are recognize that, like, there's, like, a formula that's really hard to step out of. But when you have authors pushing it, and you have your readership sort of making the moves, they will get there eventually. Yeah. They really will. And you're starting to see it, certainly. And that's been exciting, I think, for all readers, not just you know young adult readers, but everybody. Because I think we've also seen some of those techniques applied to adult books, too. Um, you can sort of identify categories and things like that in the adult world, too. But and I also think that what is happening, as you were saying about you know that they'll catch up, gets back to our conversation about the conversations, right. and that is, that the pressure keeps up and, yeah. and that we work in concert. It's not just, you know, like, well, here are three people trying to make change. It's like, no, actually, there's this whole movement yeah. happening and we all are kind of trying to Embrace make it. this happen. Make it happen. Well, we don't have a whole lot more time. I'm seeing our clock tick down. I'm really curious, Libba, what's happened? Where, I mean, where, where are you going to go I mean, with this? Because you have been around for a while. Diviners is like this thing. You could stay in this forever. <laughs> I, I don't want to leave the Not 20s. if I want to stay married. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a great, this, this is a great era though. There's so much to uh, mine. There is so much to mine. And, uh, and it's <laughs> a and diviner's every novel. single minute of it. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a diviner's novel, meaning there's multiples. So, like, there, there, no, there are four altogether. And then if I, if I even, if I even, you know, pretend that I can count to five, you know. Yeah. Three shall be the number thou shalt count. Um, then I will be. Uh, uh, there. Speaking of community, yeah. there will be a whole bunch of people staging an intervention. Like, this no, yeah. no, you're not allowed to write anymore. Well, you know what's fun is that we're still in between. We're in the in between phase. It was something I missed with Harry Potter actually, where you had to wait for the next one to come. You couldn't binge watch like you know, right. like, like 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 Netflix books. <laughs> I mean, like my kids I'm just not blow Netflix. through them. Yeah. You're just gonna have to wait. You have to just wait. Mama needs a break. You have to wait. It makes it even more meaningful when it comes out. So, well, <laughs> Libba, thank you so much for thank being here. Thank you so here. much, Rich. Wonderful, David. We have more to come. Right. Um, Grand finale. That's I'm right. Now. But we have Libra, this is Libra Bray once again, and we'll be back with another segment in just a little bit. We have Matthew LaPena here to close us out. Looking forward to talking more in just a little bit. Thanks so much. Who's your favorite author? Lois Lowry. And how does it feel when you read her books? Um, well, The Giver especially is my favorite book of hers. Um, I really love reading it because. I, it makes me feel like, I don't, it makes me feel special. And when you read their books, how does it make you feel? Like anything's possible in literature and in life. And does it inspire you to do anything creative after? Oh yeah, it makes me want to write. Who's your favorite author? Uh, I think Nick Hornby. And um, what is, how does it make you feel when you read their books? Um, it makes me feel better about life. Like it really makes you reflect. Who's your favorite author? Uh, George R.R. R. Martin. And how does it make you feel when you read their books? Adventurous. Who's your favorite author? Um, probably Victoria Schwab. And how does it make you feel when you read her books? Really happy and, you know, excited and, you know, kind of adrenaline pumping. Jodi Picoult. <laughs> and how does it feel when you read her books? Uh, when I read her books, I don't know, I just feel inspired and, like, um, she writes about a lot of different issues and it really makes me, like, think when I'm reading her books and, like, want to, ch want to change something. My favorite author is Rick Riordan. And how does it make you feel when you read his books? Um, it puts me in the place of his, of his character. Sarah Jessen, and how does it feel when you read her books? Um, I don't know. I really like reading her books because they um, teach you lessons and make you feel good. Who's your favorite author? Uh, William Shakespeare. And how does it feel when you read his books? Um, it's amazing. It's so interesting how someone could come up with all the uh, rhymes and all of the intense um, scenes. And how does it feel when you read their books? Um, it makes the world feel a lot bigger than it actually was before. Who's your favorite author? Uh, that would be J.K. Rowling. And how does it make it, you feel when you read her books? Um, well, I guess because her what she's known for is Harry Potter. I guess you could say magical, just because when you go and you read her books, you get transported into a different world. Um, at the moment, Rainbow Rowell is my favorite author. Yeah. And how does it make you feel when you read her books? I don't know, they're just really relatable, so I enjoy reading them. Uh, my favorite author is Tim O'Brien. 
And how does it feel, make you feel when you read his books? Um, well, when I read his books, it makes me feel sort of inspired to write about people basically in a war, especially things that are going overseas. J.K. Rowling. How does it make you feel when you read her books? Um, they're very creative and exciting. Connor Franta. John Green. And how does it make you feel when you read Connor Franta's books? Inspired to do something and be creative out in the world. How does it make you feel to read John Green's book? Well, his books are really like nice and peaceful, so it's like I really like reading the books because they're calm. Uh, right now, I think it's Cassandra Clare. How does it make you feel when you read her books? Uh, well, I just finished the, um, her The Mortal Instrument series like a week ago, and I kind of cried my eyes out. I would say Arthur Conan Doyle for the Sherlock Holmes series. And how does it make you feel when you finish one of his books? I feel... It almost makes me want to observe people to see if I can pick up some of the stuff like he does. Rochelle Weed. How does it make you feel when you read her books? Um, I guess good, happy, it's fun. Who's your favorite author? Um, I really enjoy Veronica Roth, how she writes and what she does with the characters. And how does it make you feel when you read her books? Well, when I read her books, I really feel like something like intense is going to happen. I really like that, and I feel like adrenaline. Who's your favorite author? Sophia Davis. And how does it feel when you read her books? I get really excited, and I really get into them. And does it inspire you to do anything creative after? I actually write my own young adult books now, or I'm working on them. All right, we're at BookCon 2015. I'm Rich Folley. This is BookView Now on PBS.org. We've been here for two full, fun days. Lots of excitement, lots of great guests all week. We're on our last segment right now. We have David Levithan's closing us out, but we also have Matt De La Pena. Matt's book is Last Stop on Market Street. But Matt, you have so many other great books. Ball Don't Lie, Mexican White Boy, many others. You said you're yeah. working on another one, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Sure. Welcome. Oh, Thanks, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. And David, I know you all were on a panel together today. We were all, this, you're all coming from the We Need Diverse Books panel. We, we've been on lots of panels many, many together. Panels. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me how you guys know each other. I mean, we, we, God, this we is after Ball Don't Lie? Yes, yeah. Yeah, no, early on we were, we were both publishing at the same publishing house and I yeah. think it's just one of these conventions that's been... Dinner. I think you actually pulled me in socially and okay. then I became part of the YA community a little bit before yeah. I felt like I was kind of on the outskirts. Interesting. Yeah. And now you can't get out of it. Now I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in the club. Yeah. You're in Scotland. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're like built in. But we, we haven't pre prevented you from doing things like picture books. This is true. I mean, who knew that the trick to getting on the New York Times bestseller list was to write a picture book? This, that's a shocking thing. When it happened, I was like, wow, I'm going to use this for all my books. Right, right. <laughs> so how, how did this book happen? I mean, where, where does it come from? Well, I have one previous p picture book called uh, A Nation's Hope, right. it's a, but it's a biography. And this one actually started, the illustrator had a blog, and it was uh, kind of about his life before he was signed. He, he had never writ, uh, illustrated a book yet, and my agent showed me one of his blogs and I had a picture of him with his grandmother on the bus and I loved this illustration um, I loved the vibe of it and so I told my agent and he said do you think you could write a book around that idea and it just so happened that when I lived in LA for four years I was on the bus so I have a lot of experience on the bus nice and with you know, public transportation and just sort of noticing the different worlds depending on what part of town you are with the bus, you know, using the bus. So that's how it started. And, and to be honest with you, it was a long process because our editor went on maternity leave. So I almost kind of forgot about this book. And then when it came out, we were so excited that it did so well, you know? So you had already written it. And it yeah. was like basically waiting for it was the waiting editor to come for back. two years. Wow. So it was kind of a long process. Very long maternity leave. <laughs> well, it was just it's that suspicious. and the illustrations. <laughs> but but it's, it's rare, though, for a picture book author to actually know the illustrator's style while writing it. That's I mean, true. Did that inform you? Do you feel you wrote the book you did because you sort of had these illustrations in I, You know what? I would say no, just because I'm not savvy or experienced enough okay. to have done that. Right. But I do know that we worked kind of closely together in a way that I know this usually doesn't happen. So we would actually... he. He'd email me on a part of the text, and he'd email and say, do you think we could find a place for another animal in there? So it was kind of a collaboration it, during the process, which is, I know, not the normal path. How about well, just the, the, the compressed nature of picture books, you know, when you're writing the words? I mean, obviously, with a, you're, you're so expansive in a novel, you've got yeah. a big story behind you. You still have a big story in here, 
but you're telling it with far fewer words. What's that challenge to kind of move between those two worlds? Well, it seems like it'd be very, very foreign because, you know, I have six novels and only two picture books, but I started with spoken word poetry. So the first thing I ever did when I was writing, I got a, pub a poem published. And so that's all I did probably for five years before I even started to write a novel. So in a weird way, writing picture books, is, it, it's like going home. Um, the hard part, though, is to try to, how can I have meaning in such a short book? Like, where's the takeaway? And that's where I took a couple wrong turns with this book. I tried to have big, heavy endings, and it was like, where are the parents? And it was kind of about him losing his parents. And then I realized in the final draft that I needed to just be simple. And so the last note of the book is super simple. We had Jason Reynolds here yesterday, and he was talking about, um, you know, dealing with loss in a young kid's life. And, you know, I, I said something to the effect of um, a lot of kids don't even understand death. I mean, it's so foreign to them, it's so far away. And he, he reminded me that, like, that's not so for a heck of a lot of kids, whether it's disease or other things, um, that there's loss in young kids' lives a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so when you, when you thought about that, I mean, are you finding connections with kids and what's your take on on that sort of world out there of young kids who've lost someone very close to them well it's it's interesting you say that because in this book we decided or I decided to not address it but to make it just the reality so I feel like in another book it would be about the loss this book is just about him with his grandmother grandmother and to be honest with you I would say 99 percent of the readers don't think about where are the parents right. so I think similar to the way I work with race in this book, it's it's just it's not about that issue, but it includes that issue. Right. So I guess it's not directly confronting death. Yeah. So tell me your poetry. When you were writing poetry, um, were you writing to a specific audience like you do when you're thinking about your books, or were the, the themes very similar to the, the, the themes that you're covering uh, in all your books? That's a good question because my poems were exactly the same things as my novels. Mm -hmm. Were they considered? Is, Adult poems. I mean, they would be adult poems. Actually, you know what? Let me let me pull back. I was writing about the college experience and the high school experience. So I guess they, in a weird way, they probably were YA, but there was a lot of cursing. Yeah, <laughs> hey, wrong with cursing. In yeah, YA. that's true. But I think I was really. In, I'm, I'm mixed race, so my my dad's Mexican, my mom's white. All my poems were about being mixed, and they were about my neighborhood, which was right on the Mexican border. Do you still write poetry? I, you know what, I don't, but I still read it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be something happening with poetry now, too. I mean, you're seeing some really wonderful things happening with poetry. Oh, there's and amazing sort stuff. Of public embrace of it, and you know, where it seemed to be sort of an esoteric thing for scholars or something. Yeah. Like that. It seems to really be, I mean, whether it's slam and things like that, which sort of open the door, but there's a lot of other things happening. I love slam poetry, though. I think it's incredible, the rhythms. And, yeah. and I think, hopefully, novelists take that poetic sensibility into their novels, you know? try to make good sentences, you know, try to be sparse, try to be economical with language. So I think reading poetry really informs writing novels. And reading picture books, now that I have a one-year-old daughter, and we read picture books to her all day, and it's incredible the poetry you find in, in the good picture books. Yeah. Yeah, the cadence, I mean, especially when you're reading them over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. You start to, like, get good at it. You start to, like, oh, work yeah. it up. It becomes a performance. Oh, I could know, do so. Good Night Moon right now <laughs> out on 42nd Street. <laughs> that, yeah. That's one of her go-tos. Oh, man. <laughs> that, that's the one that puts her down every night. God, you know, God the, bless it. I know. Good Night Moon has a really mysterious cadence to it that I've never fully understood, but something about it is right. so magical. And I think the mysterious part of it is what keeps the parents interested. In. Like, yeah, right. Good Night Nobody? Yeah. Like. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah. I and mean, I keep thinking about that, you know? <laughs> Good night, nobody. You're right. You're right. I think, uh, so was it the birth of your daughter that, but obviously not, because it was sitting no. out there for a couple, you know, for a long time. You yeah. had a kid just so you'd have somebody. Well, to actually, <laughs> I w I'm not above that. <laughs> I might have another one. So I have a, you know, a little, maybe a boy and a girl. So right, I have a little, too. cover some bases. No, you know, I just, it's a, such an honor to work with a talented illustrator. It just... When you, when you write this, po basically a poem, and then you get back the first sketches, and they're literally just rough sketches, and you're like, this is awful. And then you see the finished art, and you're just so blown away that you know this c connects with your words. So I love the process. Um, I, I, I hope I get to keep doing them. 
I will say this, and I don't know if you've ever done this, David, but I did a school visit with really young kids recently, and these kids are hard. Like, you go in there <laughs> with this big plan. Usually I go into, like, rougher high schools. I had this plan of what I was going to do, and I go in there, and I'm like, what do you guys really want in life? And this kid goes, I want a machine gun. And I was like, okay, let's move on. <laughs> and yeah. then I said, what are you guys yeah. happy you have? Like your parents, you know? And another kid was like, I like my head. And I was like, all right, so that's a good answer, but yeah. you ruined my plan. So they're tough. They're yeah. challenging. You have to find a way in. Yes. And, um, you know, sometimes that's the illustrations and drawing. Sometimes the way you talk about them. It's so true. That's tricky, for sure. How about your, let's talk about your, um, your novels. Sure. As they, um, on, a, on a heavier note, yeah, dealing yeah. with sort of really disastrous scenarios. Yeah. And in really so. just going hardcore. And also, I'd love to, for you to talk to you about sort of balancing sort of genre and identity there because yeah. again, it's a very different. From this your is previous this is a books. good question because I think it's something I've been thinking a lot about, which is like writing books that feature diverse characters in books that aren't about diversity, which I'm doing in this, and I'm also doing in, uh, in my novels, my two most recent novels, which are The Living and The Hunted. And yeah, it's more commercial novels. I'd written some quieter books, and I wanted to see if I could write a page turner, which is very hard. Um, and I really respect people who write books that you just kind of want to keep going. Um, but I wanted to feature you know, mixed race characters in books that that are big books. And, you know, race is going to come up because the characters are mixed and they're confronting a different demographic for the first time. Um, so, you know, there are little tensions, but the book isn't about those tensions. So it's more about an earthquake and a pharmaceutical situation. So The Hunted is the second book and it just came out. And it's really fun to find my books penetrating a new demographic, which is suburban schools with mostly white kids that are reading about a, a mixed protagonist. And so I guess in a way, that was my goal. I wanted to see if, <clears throat> if that would happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just been such an honor to see my books in the hands of new readers. There seems to be a theme there because Jenny Han was here the other day and people ask her about, you know, there's actually, a, her book is the first time that a, a best-selling New York Times book has had a, an Asian American on the cover. And yeah. they said it was like groundbreaking and it made you know, people in the Asian community, she said, cry. And yet, she's very clear that, like, she's not writing about an Asian character. She's writing about a girl, a yeah. girl with the universal experiences, who happens to be Asian. And yes, it maybe was a little bit groundbreaking to put that character on the cover. Yeah. But she's particular about, you know, letting you know that, like, it's not an Asian story. And yeah. I, I don't want you to mistake it as that. Well, and here's the thing, though. You know, if you think about it, you take Jenny Hong when she was young, the books that were put in front of her mostly featured white protagonists, mm -hmm. but she pulled what she wanted to pull out of it, right? And so hopefully the same, the same things happen when it's the opposite, when it's an Asian protagonist and a white reader. You know, it's still, it's the universal and the human condition, hopefully, is the, is the takeaway. Yeah. But I think it's incredible that there's an Asian person on the cover of a bestseller. I think that's, that's a huge step. Yeah, you know? I think so too. And actually, you know, Going back to your stuff, like I love that you, you have two boys kissing, and then you bookended it with ten years later in a new era of, of this kind of book. So I think these are the groundbreaking things that, that make real change. It's going so fast. I mean, the change is happening so quickly, to the point where we we talk about things that are groundbreaking right now, but like how quickly gay marriage has been adopted by the nation and how quickly shows like Glee and other things and Ryan Murphy have changed the face of television. When will this not be groundbreaking anymore? When will this be like, when will we stop talking about as groundbreaking? When will and, it just be ground? Just normal? <laughs> How long? I mean, could it be next year? For well, I have a theory. I think in 35 years, there's going to be a panel at, at BEA that's going to be all uh, old white straight males <laughs> saying when can we get our books in you know, why are white we? men and I'll be on that panel too because I'm mixed so <laughs> it'll be amazing <laughs> it's very possible yeah well listen Matt it has been wonderful to have you here yeah thanks David it's so good to have you this thanks. has been a really compelling discussion I've, I've enjoyed it quite a bit it was a great way to end what I think has been a fantastic book con I just love the fact that there is book con I want to see it grow and grow and grow and um, see more and more excited kids come in. 
Um, it's been wonderful to have you all here too. This has been BookCon 2015. Come back for BookCon 2016. We'll have just as great of, uh, authors and panels and, and fans of reading, uh, and more we hope. So thanks very much for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again really soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Funding for BookView Now is provided by the Wincote Foundation.